And joining us now on the debate, in the nation's capital, Keith Martin, former Liberal MP for Esquimalt Juan de Fuca in British Columbia. And with us here in studio, Sylvia Bashevkin, Principal of University College at the University of Toronto, Alison Lote, Executive Director of Samara, John Duffy, Principal at Strategy Corp, and Michael Bliss, the historian and author. And a reminder that we call tonight's program Your Agenda because, in part, Fifth Column blogger Mike Miner is hosting a live chat on our Inside Agenda blog at tvo.org slash the agenda or on our Facebook page, facebook.com slash the agenda. You can also tweet your way towards us, twitter.com, hashtag your agenda. So just jump in and we'll get your comments up on the screen throughout the course of the broadcast. Welcome, everybody. Having said all of that, Keith Martin, nice to see you in the nation's capital again. How much fun are you having this campaign, Keith, now that you don't have to knock on 30,000 doors this time? Believe it or not, I feel relaxed. Steve, <laughs> yeah, no, I believe what's it. What's going on here, and uh, <laughs> it's a great feeling. It's I a great totally feeling believe it. To be here. Let me read something. Uh, Andrew Coyne, no doubt, would have loved to be in our company tonight here, the guy from McLean's Magazine, but he's not here. But fortunately, we have something to read, and then I'll get your take on what he's got to say. By now, it will have occurred to many people that there is something deeply sick about our national politics. It is worse than it was. It is worse than elsewhere. And it is not going to get better. Politics in this country, he writes, federal politics at least, is in a kind of death spiral whose terminus is not dictatorship but irrelevance. It exudes a sense of enemy, a corrosive cynicism that is not just indifferent to principle but hostile to it. Okay, Keith, putting you to work right away. What's your view of what Andrews had to say? I agree with 95% in that statement, Steve. The only part I don't agree with is that it's not going to change. It can change and it must change. But Andrew points to the fundamental disease that has infected Ottawa, and that is the fact that we have a situation where politics is played uh, within the House. The enemy is the person across from you. It's short-term um, political gamesmanship. It's got nothing to do or little to do with the at real enemy, which are the problems that our citizens and our country faces. So you see political parties fighting over advantage for short-term gain just to get into power uh, by throwing mud on the other side, as opposed to building a better, more comprehensive and inspirational uh, set of platforms and policies that deal with the real challenges that our citizens face every day. Alison, what's your reaction to that? Uh, well, I share his concern for the negativity of politics in our public life. And I guess I think two things. Um, the first is that we don't want to risk being too alarmist, because if we want our politics to be engaging, we have to be a little bit constructive as well. Um, and I think it's worth reminding ourselves that regardless of their frustration, citizens have a pretty deep commitment to democracy in this country, and we should build from that. And I guess the second thought is to say, okay, well, I guess we're concerned about the irrelevance, so what to do about it? And one reason for it may be that we do very little to ask people actively to participate in their politics. Um, I think we know the number one reason why people vote or why they volunteer, or why they even run, is because they were asked. And so it's probably worth maybe us talking a bit about whether we have the infrastructure that actually gets people meaningfully engaged in an ongoing way in our public life or just ask them to vote once in a while and that's it. Gotcha. John Duffy, death spiral, you agree with Coyne? Um, no, but, but mostly I'm with Keith. I do agree that things are very unwell. Um, in federal politics. I think there's a couple of reasons <clears throat> um, that I would really point to. Uh, I'm not one of these people who believes that it's necessarily long-term and structural. Uh, I think there's been two pretty pernicious developments in the past five years at the federal level. And they are? Uh, I think the first is that um, the conservative government's approach to governing actually involves quietly withdrawing from a number of policy areas in Canadian life. Uh, we don't have an energy strategy. We don't have a climate policy. If we have a foreign policy, it hasn't been articulated. I don't know what it is. I don't know what our defense policy is. We don't have a broadcasting policy. We don't have a telecom policy. We used to have all these things. They've quietly been withdrawn without any debate, without any discussion. And that's, I think, at the heart of the Harper government's modus operandi. Now, Which is to get the federal government less in our lives. Smaller federal government in the federation, okay. smaller role for government in the economy. It's not done with fanfare and big announcements. It's just done by not doing things. Number two. Number two, on the other side of the House, and I'm not, I don't want to make a partisan point about this, so I'll say some things about my own party. I think the Liberals have, for probably smart strategic and tactical reasons, made a very narrow argument with the Conservative government. I don't think they've made a sweeping one. They feel very much that they were burned with a sweeping critique under Monsieur Dion and the attempt to embrace environmentalism and bring it into the Canadian political mainstream. Liberals have really shied away. 
So the quarrel between the liberals and the conservatives is very narrow. And it results, I think, a lot of what Keith's talking about is because of that, you don't see the big issues being discussed. They go begging, and they are coming. Um, they are upon us. Uh, climate change is upon us. Um, we've got oil at $100 a barrel fairly routinely. That is an energy problem that is going to reshape our way of life. That is upon us. There are numerous of these factors that are upon us. They will be bringing politics back, whether the current narrow non-argument in Ottawa admits of it or not. Michael Bliss, what do you say on that? I say conflicting and confused things, I think. Um, <laughs> I think there is a long-term problem of political parties in Canada. The political parties are going the way of churches. People don't believe in them. They're losing members. Uh, they're just shadows of what they were. They're losing their coherence and very clearly losing their competence. And that's a long-term thing. But I think that Andrew is too uh, uh, apocalyptic and generalizing from short-term issues. This is a, a strange, almost throwaway election that, um, that, that seems to mean very little. I think that after this election, there is going to be a huge sea change one way or another and going back to your introductory quote for example we're going to see the the crisis of the uh, liberal and NDP now almost indistinguishable in their policy positions and one way or another I think our four-party system is going to to change drastically and by the next election we'll be into possibly a quite new politics but still with the old curse of these decrepit political parties <laughs> and, and the ter uh, terrible partisanship that, that, that poisons Canadian politics for the most part. Sylvia Bashevkin. Well, I think, Steve, that we may be too apocalyptic in assuming that things are better elsewhere because that's one of the assumptions, really, in the quotation. And it seems to me if we look at the United States or Libya or Egypt or... Um, some of the West European countries that are in huge financial difficulties right now, it's hard to argue that things are all that bad in Canada. I mean, our neighbors to the south are highly polarized. They have a parliamentary style system in a congressional... Uh, in a republic. They're not supposed exactly, to have that. Exactly. In a, in a, you know, in a uh, congressional rubric. So the argument that things are so much healthier elsewhere, that there are more citizens engaged and that there are more vibrant parties and that there is... Uh, a healthier uh, you know, political discourse, I think is a very hard case to make. I think this is much more of a generalizable problem about the decline of the relevance of parliamentary parties in most um, Western democratic systems. So, uh, you know, and, and the point that John makes about um, the role of uh, the state versus the market, I think these are crucially important issues, which in fact the parties are quite divided on. So I'm not at all sure that we've seen them all grouped around a kind of mushy middle where we can't distinguish them all that well. Well, you say quite divided on, and yet we have a guest on the show tonight who at one time felt quite comfortable in the Reform Alliance and then moved to the Liberal Party and felt fairly comfortable running as a Liberal as well, which, you know, Keith, I don't want to pick on you, but trying to kind of helps make the thesis of this program come to life, which is that if the biggest difference among the political parties nowadays is one and a half points on the corporate tax rate, we don't have humongous differences among the main parties in this country. Is that fair to say? Uh, I think there are there are I mean, there are differences in my view, but I'm 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 partisan. Uh, but I want to get back to just a, a point, Steve, that ties in what uh, Alison, Sylvia, uh, John, and Michael are are we've been speaking about, which is why aren't the public engaged in the political process? Okay. Traditionally, our system, you elect members of parliament to aggregate the interests of your constituency mm -hmm. and be able to represent them in, in parliament. But what Canadians see is they, they see if they get involved in political parties, are their actions and activities actually going to have an effect on the other end? Mm -hmm. And I think the, the crude answer to that is simply no. And people represent, people understand that. That's why they're turning their back on the place behind me, Parliament. And they're developing relationships and they're developing uh, new uh, coalitions, if you will, between uh, individual citizens, NGOs, and other groups to try to advance issues and advance solutions to the problems they have. Because they're saying, why should I run for, for politics? If I run for politics and I'm simply going to be a mouthpiece for Ottawa back to my constituency, I have no ability or little ability to actually affect change in Parliament because members of Parliament 
and are disarticulated from the system. We have so much power within the offices of, of leaders' offices. They're the ones that are controlling the shots. They're the ones that are advancing ideas, that are, well, that are making policy. The MPs have very little to do about this at all, which is an utter violation of democracy in our country. Here's a couple of charts that actually just buttress what everybody's saying around the table. Michael Smith, our director, if you could, let's bring, we're going to bring these up in succession, Michael. Here's the first one. Voter turnout from 1867 to 2008. We did pretty well till about a half a century ago. We were tipping up around the 80% turnout mark, and then that graph started to go south. And the last election was the worst turnout ever, 208. Uh, fewer than 50, excuse me, 60% of us voted in that uh, election campaign. Um, this will not come as any surprise either. Let's look at trust in occupations. Who are the most trusted people? Well, actually, we've got a couple of them around this table here. Scientists at 74%, but look at you university professors at 57. <laughs> Journalists at 32, which seems very high. Pollsters at 28. Priests down at 21. Union leaders, 16. Politicians barely ahead of bloggers. Uh, Allison, is it possible to have a healthy political culture in this country with those kinds of ratings? Uh, makes it more challenging, um, <laughs> to say the least. although yeah, although you know, complete trust would I'd also be concerned about because we don't want you know Ottomans all agreeing blindly. Um, but I guess probably the, the bigger question is just why why don't people have why do people have such little faith in politicians? Um, and one and one reason I think is because at least I hear is is because they don't do what we think they should do or what they say they're going to do. Um, but then if you actually, you know, I've just finished doing a series of exit interviews with 65 former members of parliament where I asked them, what's the essential purpose of your job? And I had about 65 different answers. Hmm. So it's worth saying, you know, are we actually clear on what this role is about, mm -hmm. what it's meant to do? Mm -hmm. um, and are we actually in, agree in agreement with that? Because if the MPs don't agree, it's unlikely citizens agree. And so we're bound to be disappointed, um, just by definition. Michael Bliss, I need to go to you on this because your newest book is called The Making of Modern Medicine. So you know what ails us, because you're writing all about this stuff. <laughs> why, don't you, uh, why don't you add to Keith's list, if you would, about some of the things you think ails our politics in the country now? Actually, I, I think that Keith is dead on, except f in the way in which the politicians are making it worse. And my particular concern this electoral season is the ubiquity of attack advertising, which has been creeping up on us for about 20, 25 years, and at first, you, people said, attack ads, that's hitting below the belt and maybe we'd better not do it. And then the pollsters said, well, yes, but actually it, it, it works if you can kick the other party in the groin. Mm -hmm. And what has happened gradually is that the politicians have found there's no referee blowing the whistle. And so now a large part of the electoral battle is really vile, vicious attack advertising that fouls the nests of all the politicians because the parties are tainted by the vile twisted minds that create those attack ads and the decent politicians seem to be simply helpless in the face of this it works attitude. Well, but the fact is, John, I mean, you'd be the first to acknowledge it, I think, that the Conservatives did a heck of a job with those attack ads, making people believe that Michael Ignati was just visiting and he didn't come back for you. Those, those were really tough <clears throat> ads, and um, they seem to have worked for a while anyway. Yeah, I think, I think they have so far, and Ignati was struggling effectively, but he's got a long way to go to get off the, you know, sub-basement that he was put into with those things in terms of people's even willingness to listen to Are him. they worse now, though, than they've ever been, those attack ads? Oh, yeah, it's much worse. I think there, there's another dimension to this that I, I want to use, choose my words very carefully about, but it's important. Um, in a world of long-term voter decline, uh, turnout decline, um, that's sort of become a permanent operating factor. And I think some time has been given in all of the parties to figuring out how to make that work for them. If you look at the 2008 election and compared to the 2006 election, every party's vote dropped. Okay? It was a lower turnout election. The Little election result turned on 100,000 Conservatives didn't show up, 100,000 New Democrats didn't show up, 800,000 Liberals did not show up. Some of that had to do with the discrediting to the point of mockery to where it was really not something you'd want to be caught in public doing voting for that man, Dion. Um, I think, you know, in effect, I think the Conservatives have learned how to work this operational reality better. And where that takes you is into a different place that is a very boundaryless world. If you don't mind lower voter turnout because your people 
are the most likely to still show up. If you've got a higher tolerance for that problem, then all of a sudden it's not a problem if you're lowering turnout, mm -hmm. as long as you're not lowering your turnout. Right. And the old saw was, you know, when I got started in politics, it was, look, McDonald's and Burger King never accuse each other of food poisoning because then everybody won't want hamburgers. Well, the problem is if one of the chains has a better ability to withstand food poisoning scares than the other, <laughs> then it's in their competitive advantage to a, in a short-term way to be able, to, uh, to, be able to, to work that advantage. And then the other problem is if you're not actually committed to the idea of national governance in the first place as a point of ideology, it's doubly hard to resist it. So somewhere along that curve, I think we've got a built-in problem now where it's almost the dynamic is feeding on itself a little bit. That's very dangerous. I want to ask Sylvia about something she would know a lot about because you're surrounded by bright young people all the time in your capacity at University of Toronto. 37% of voters between the age of 18 to 24 voted in 2008. Let me say that again. 37% of people between the age of 18 and 24 voted in the last election. You know, how, why do young people not vote? Well, first of all, I think it's important to celebrate the fact that 37% did vote, given what we've been talking about, in the <laughs> sense of low trust in politicians, wedge campaigns where some parties actually thrive on driving voters apart instead of having a, na a national conversation about how we're going to come together as Canadians to solve problems. Um, and I think it's important to note that many of those who did vote are actually quite active politically, perhaps not in parties, but in extra-parliamentary politics. In terms of the other roughly, uh, you know, 60 percent who've, who've chosen not to vote, you know, I think one of the questions is, uh, what have parties done to try and renew their base? You know, there was a time when the campuses were quite divided. You know, in my own courses, I had to very carefully separate <laughs> students who would be too engaged because it was too disruptive. And some of your professors. <laughs> well, possibly professors as well. But the point is that, that party life on campus is, is, uh, is, is barely uh, palpable. And... Um, we see, in fact, uh, generations now of undergraduates who have been very committed to activism in local uh, environmental groups, to uh, international NGO work where they're highly committed towards changing the world and making it better, but somewhere else. But not through partisan politics. Exactly, but not through partisan politics. Michael Bliss, when you were influencing young minds in the classroom, let's say 25 years ago, uh, were they more open to the partisan political argument back then than they are today? I think there's been a gradual decline mm -hmm. over about 40 years, but what I would say is you've got to be careful not to generalize from one or two elections. Mm -hmm. uh, this election is like watching a beer league hockey game. It, it's just there are no issues. The quality of the players isn't very good. The quality of the play is terrible. But you can imagine another election or two down the line, if we had... Uh, dynamic new politicians emerge. Suppose we had another Trudeau for whale or woe, or we had another big issue. For example, it may be by the next election that there will be a big health care proposal on the table. Well, that participation rate could sp spark up quite a bit. Uh, this is this is just mm -hmm. a, a really bad time, and it's been it's not been a very good run for since I think about 1988, the last really interesting election was the free trade election. Which is chronicled in John's book, I might say very nicely, Fights of Our Lives. Keith Martin, tell me this, do you think people, young people today, understand the distinction between liberalism, conservatism, defined in a Canadian way? I, I don't think so, Steve, and, and I don't think they necessarily care about that at all. Mm -hmm. What they do care about, I think, are the issues that was mentioned by your guests on environmentalism, uh, health. We have our aging population, the great tsunami that's hitting us now uh, that we're utterly unprepared to deal with on so many levels. They care about big issues, but they don't see that Parliament is a place where they can have an effect on that. So that's why I think that they're not engaging. And when they see, I think it was, uh, as Michael was referring to this, that when they see us as politicians disrespecting each other, by the behavior that we display in question period, people look at that, young people look at that, and many others, and say, why should we get involved in that when we wouldn't allow that anywhere else? It is an utterly dysfunctional mm -hmm. environment. So they look mm -hmm. and seek and find places where, they, where their actual efforts can have an effect because they just don't see this place 
uh, as a place that reflects their interests, their values, or where they can actually have that effect. Now, it doesn't mean to say it can't change. It can, and it must, to deal with the big challenges that I think John mentioned are hitting us today. But this is where I come in, and, and thank goodness we have a historian at this table who, who you know, has written about this and remembers this. Mike Pearson and, and John Diefenbaker had awful arguments across the floor of the House of Commons from each other 50 years ago. It wasn't any more peaceful back then, right? That's true. And I, the first time I took students to Ottawa in 1961, they found Ottawa, uh, the House of Commons, an appalling place for the same reason <laughs> they do today. Mm -hmm. In a way, it's, it's been that way. But you know, that was 50 years ago. And at some point, you say, this is the 21st century. Canadians have a right to expect improvement in most areas of life and they have a right to expect an improvement in this in the quality of their politics uh, an improvement in mm -hmm. in their civic culture mm -hmm. and instead of that we seem to be getting a deterioration and one other point I would make when I talk about this being a bad time it may be you know for 40 years we have been saying Parliament is dysfunctional and it's a deterrent to good people. Uh, and maybe we're now f feeling the effect of that 40 years of cumulative deterrence. One of the things about this election is where are the star candidates? It doesn't look to me as though the political parties are being able to give us anything that looks like a great crop of incoming MPs. If you were a star, would you go into well, politics today? Well, it's very today? hard to recruit. I mean, if you speak with party recruiters, they'll tell you it's very hard to make the case. First of all, in minority parliaments, it's very hard to predict when parliament's going to fall. <laughs> We all know that not only do backbenchers have relatively little influence, but we can see cabinet ministers appear to be muzzled. They rarely have anything to say that's not in a script. So you have to ask yourself if in the 1961 uh, a newly elected MP could dream of going from the backbench to the middle bench to the front bench and actually having some influence, whether in the shadow cabinet or the cabinet. Right now, unless you're a party leader, it's pretty darn difficult to see how you'd have much influence on something you care about. I mean, we ideally want people going into public life who want to move an issue forward, move, uh, you know, move the country forward, serve their constituents. It's not clear what the motivation would be for many to run. John Duffy. I, I think that's absolutely right. And I mean, <clears throat> I think there's, there's two, you know, I describe what I think as two of the three pillars of the way that the, the conservative government operates. And, and I don't want to be too partisan about this. I'm but not going to let you be. Don't worry. But I think it's real. Look, there's a secular trend of centralization in Ottawa, for heaven's sake. You know, I mean, it was part of the liberal government that moved it along in its time and in its way mm -hmm. and along its pace. But I think something has changed. And what has changed is um, the subtle shift in the sense of what the role of parliament is on the part of the government. Um, Really, I think this government, and they showed this in their approach to the coalition crisis in 2008, and they've shown in other things that they say and do, actually, I think, holds part of the time a view that I call direct populism or populist centralism, that really the way our system works is Canadians vote for a prime minister, and that's kind of the end of it. And whoever, whoever gets the most votes for a prime minister, well, that's the prime minister. Well, that's not what our Constitution that says. That's not our system. But yeah. there's a whole lot of people, and we saw them come out all over the country, and they weren't just partisan conservatives who did not know that that's not how the system works mm -hmm. in the coalition crisis in 2008. Now, what flows out of that is a level of abuse and contempt for Parliament and a willingness to brush Parliament aside that we have never seen before. It really is, it's also brushing aside the entire cabinet table in a way that we haven't seen before. And when you do that, the idea that you're going to bring in good people and nurture them and have them grow in there that Sylvia's talking about, it's gone. Who wants to go and be, uh, uh, I mean, it used to be the trained seals, the, were, were the people you felt sympathy for were the backbenchers, but at least the cabinet ministers got to do some stuff. Mm -hmm. they, they're so constrained now, their scope for authority, their ability to say what they think, their ability to make change is down to a smidgen. And well, who wants to do that? The ramifications of that may be apparent in this chart here. Michael Smith, if you would, let's bring up the latest one. We are apparently... I wouldn't have thought this, but if you compare the UK with Canada, with the US, with Sweden, we have the most inattentive public of any of those countries. Uh, if you look at the blue bars, that's all ages, and we're still number one in a way you don't want to be number one. And if you look at young people, here we go again, 18 to 24, they are massively disengaged from the news, according to Citizens Adrift, the democratic disengagement of young Canadians. Allison, your organization is all about political engagement and trying to get people to pay more attention to this stuff. What do you think? 
Um, I'm embarrassed to admit I've actually read that book. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so there's, there is a bit of good news in that, which is uh, it, we're, we're actually sort of smack in the middle internationally in the degree to which we pay attention to news. Um, but I guess just peeking up at the chart that you had up on the screen, um, where it shows that Canada and, uh, thank you for letting me cheat here, uh, Canada and the U.S. are less attentive than other countries. It actually makes me ask the question, is there something about our news media that is less relevant than media in Europe? Hmm. Um, and no doubt, uh, people in newsrooms across the country are struggling with that question every day. Um, but uh, that, that's, this is the implication of that to me. Is it something uh, in, in our news media perhaps and how those public stories are being raised and discussed uh, that is, is turning people off in I some should fashion. Get, I should get Keith Martin on that one because you <laughs> no doubt had to, well you watched every day how media cover things on Parliament Hill. Uh, how much blame do you want to put for our inattentive public on that? Well, I think there's enough blame to go around for everybody, and, and I'm not sure what the answer is, Steve, in terms of, I mean, are we watching infotainment because that's what the public wants, or is the public watching infotainment because that's what they're fed? Uh, at the end of the day, I mean, there's always going to be part of it, but there has to be a place in Parliament where the really big issues are, are, are being dealt with. And not only are parliamentarians disarticulated from the decision-making process, but so is the public service. And those, the, the, the reward system, if you will, within our current system is if you're a member of parliament who is blindly loyal, rapidly partisan, and hates the other side and sees the other side as the enemy, you will be rewarded. If you're a parliamentarian that's trying to advance ideas that are constructive and, and, and want to deal with those in a, in a meaningful way, you will generally be marginalized. So parliament, unfortunately, is a place where ideas have no currency or very little currency and science is being thrown under the bus because it's all about short-term political gamesmanship. That's why in this election, what we're, I, th I think what we're seeing is really local politics played on a national stage where a few key writings that will determine whether mm -hmm. somebody gets a majority or not are where most of the emphasis is. And Mr. Harper in this case is trying to do what he can to win those particular writings as opposed to looking at the large national challenges our citizens face from coast to coast and dealing with those challenges and those solutions that all of our citizens need. Hmm. Just want to remind everybody here that we are in the first of five consecutive programs we're going to do here on TVO on the agenda on whether or not our political system is broken. This seems like a re relatively good time to have that conversation given that we're on day 13 of a 36, 37 day campaign, whatever it is. Uh, so we're happy to take your emails, your uh, tweets, you can go to Facebook, send us a note. We're going to put up emails or comments on the screen throughout the course of the broadcast. Do we have one up there? I heard in my ear a second ago. Yeah, Michael, put it up there. Here's the $64,000 question. What exactly is broken, this person's asking? Party politics or the media reporting on same? This is what we've been getting into here. Okay, who... Um who wants to go? John, go ahead, Sylvia. Well, part of it, I think, is uh, we're talking about a parliamentary system that's supposed to be uh, uh, producing legislation that helps us deal with uh, problems facing the country. John talked about the absence of policy in various uh, domains. I think one of the reasons that we can talk about an inattentive public is because one of the things that turns people onto news is mystery and intrigue and stories. And we have one of the most disciplined parliaments in the world. <laughs> I mean, it's a virtually foregone conclusion how, you know, how every vote is going to shake down. Because people who don't vote with their party whip are soon out of the party caucus and have a very t hard time winning re-election as an independent. So Occasionally, few, somebody wins. A few more free votes might raise interest. Well, get, you'd if actually you look at the attention. UK, which has a much less disciplined parliament, and it is, if you read the BNA Act, the model on which our system was founded it is the mother parliament. I mean, perhaps that's one way of making Canadian politics a bit more attractive because at least we would have the opportunity to see backbench and middle bench uh, MPs express views different from those of the party leader and, uh, and create news about, you know, voicing ideas that the public wants to see voiced. Let me ask you about tents, John, because we hear in the campaign quite frequently this notion of, come on, everybody, into the big red tent, or, you know, Stephen Harper says, we've got a nice big blue tent here. There's lots of room for everybody. If the tents are so big that everybody's welcome inside, so much so that what distinguishes party A from party B suddenly becomes less significant because those tents are so big, why should people engage with something where it doesn't appear that the differences are significant enough to warrant their involvement? Uh, I, you're, di you're going to disagree with the premise, I I'm am sure. going to disagree yes. with the premise because I'm just a disagreeable guy, Steve. That's, that's why I like to come here and argue with you. <laughs> um, I don't think the tents are too big. I think they're too small. 
Um, and I think their point of differentiation with each other is too small, and I don't think they fully articulate what they're about. They actually do so through a sort of show but don't tell kind of approach where voters are left to piece things together about what it all means, and it's not very satisfying or helpful. Um, you know, I don't blame the media, and I'll tell you why. Uh, traditional repertorial political media, outside of a few islands of sanity and goodness like TV Ontario, is actually in bigger trouble than the parties. Michael's right when he describes the parties as like the churches, mm -hmm. and I'll tell you, mainstream media covering mainstream politics is like the Catholic Church in Ireland right now. It is really in trouble. Um, I actually think the reason I blame the parties is because the reason the media is in trouble is because of the explosion of web-based information gathering and social interaction in the digital world, which is what all these young people do. That's how they do community now. They don't go to church. They don't hang out in parties. They actually go online and they connect with people all over the place. Social media has been treated as a one-way broadcast bullhorn by the parties to date when in fact it's the most incredible universe of interactivity. If we can stop trying to verticalize social media as political figures and political parties and actually open ourselves up to letting it flood us with what it wants, the possibility for a genuine, interactive, and more democratic conversation becomes very real. John, we're going and to do that's that. That's exciting in the 21st century. I'm going to take that segue because that's beautiful because we're going to do that right now. Uh -oh. We're going to get interactive. Well, that means I'm against it. That's <laughs> all theoretical. <laughs> we're going to get interactive because uh, at an undisclosed location in this building, as we're having this conversation here, Mike Miner is moderating an online chat. And Mike, I'd be very curious to hear what people have to say about our topic tonight. Well, a lot of people are kind of echoing what uh, Mr. Duffy just said in that there are these policy discussions going on among political parties, and they're the same conversations that are going online. And yet, because they're framed in a partisan or a left-right sort of way, people just don't recognize that these are the same types of discussions. They see this as politicking, and they, they ignore it. It washes right over them. Uh, some of the other things that are being said on here, James P. says that he has a hard time differentiating between the main parties in practice. Theoretically, they have a quite different policies, but when they get to government, it's the exact same thing from anybody who's in power. He also thinks that the left-right spectrum is just not useful for him in locating uh, his political values. Uh, and a lot of people are reflecting that. David H. says that there is no party that he agrees with across the board, so it's very difficult for him to throw in with one or the other. A guy going by Gas and Ezer says that the problem is that the MPs represent their parties first, their constituents second, and that this whole party system puts politics backwards in Canada. Rad says the party system makes it very difficult for a new, fresh talent to enter the political arena. And this is something else that's being talked about online as to the way that this party system is actually kind of uh, restricting the debate rather than uh, engaging the conversations that are happening throughout the country on the very topics that people are campaigning over. Thanks, Mike. Okay, you keep moderating away. TVO.org slash the agenda on the Inside Agenda Producers blog, and Mike will continue to get your comments up there. Michael Bliss, you heard some of those comments. What's your reaction? Uh, quick to cover a couple of points. First, it seems to me that it's been uh, a main theme of Canadian political history that the two major parties fight like cats and dogs for the center, and there are large numbers of people who say there really isn't much difference between them. And when they've said that in the past, what they did was go out and founded a new party. They called it the CCF and then the NDP. And it was the vehicle for people who were interested in ideas, in a movement, in something different. Uh, the, one of the key problems right now is that that party has lost its way and it thinks that it's competing for the vital center too. And I think that that's why it, it's an unstable situation that won't last past the next election. As for uh, the media and discourse, it does seem to me that uh, the quality of political discourse in the country see, seems to be deteriorating. All I have to do is say CBC and I think many viewers will understand what I'm saying. Um, parliamentary press gallery is just a shadow of what it was. Mm -hmm. and where do we find gravitas in political commentary in Canada? There's not very much of it anymore. I find that instead of gravitas on the political shows, I hear giggling. Uh, and then my final point is, no, maybe this is an old professor's uh, grumpy comment, nobody will convince me that political comments 
limited to 141 characters are going to do anything to elevate political discourse. I hate to tell you, you're exaggerating. It's, it's actually only 140. <laughs> uh, there you are. <laughs> Not that makes it worse. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think that the, the fad of the social media is a fad. Uh, people say that it causes revolutions, it wins wars. Uh, if you're a fan of the social media, it gives us salvation, and I don't believe that for a second. You mean there were wars and revolutions before social media came along? <laughs> <laughs> but they weren't it. successful. But they weren't successful, <laughs> I see. Okay, well, Keith Martin, you want to follow up on that? Because you know, obviously, um, you know, John on the one hand says that the political parties have yet to begin to figure out how to exploit properly. Uh, the potential of social media. We have, on the other hand, Michael Bliss saying that it's getting way too much credit for stuff that it has no business taking credit for. You've watched it. What do you think? Well, social media is, is just a, a tool, and I, I think the point is that in times past where there were fewer avenues upon which the citizen received his or her information, now we have an infinite array of, uh, of methods, we have an infinite array of opinions, so it's much harder for political parties, I think, to get a congruent message out to the public. But there's one point that I, I want to make about parties, is that although we live in a democracy, political parties themselves are not democratic at all. Mm. And I think one of the fundamental challenges that we face, and what has to be fixed, falls right in the lap of the political parties. The way uh, candidates are chosen, the, again, the ability of MPs to be able to have influence, Right now, what happens is within leaders' offices, it's generally young, rapidly partisan uh, uh, individuals with not a lot of real-world experience, whose my only objective really is to get power, are the ones that are making the decision, decisions. And a lot of that is based, frankly, on pollsters, that they're playing the political game for short-term gain as directed by what polling results tell them on a day-to-day -day or week-to-week -week basis. Where is the grand vision? Where is the connection between the political party's desire and ethics to deal with the big challenges uh, that face us? Those are not uh, in play. I mean, we're, we're not all gonna, in Parliament going to sit around and, and sing Kumbaya and have a big group hug. That's not going to happen. But we need to have the big, tough, knock-down, drag-out battles on what each of our political parties believe ought to be done to deal with those big challenges that are in front, front of us because if we don't, people are going to get hurt. And in that, that'll be a pox on our house. Hmm. Uh, yeah, I, what I'm about to do is give a provincial example in the middle of a federal election campaign, but I wonder if it speaks to what Keith just said. This past week, we saw that the longest serving member of the Ontario legislature uh, lost his job, sort of. Uh, he was challenged for his nomination. Norm Sterling, I'm talking mm -hmm. about, in Carleton, Mississippi Mills, Eastern Ontario. He was challenged for his nomination uh, by somebody else, and uh, the party did not go to bat for him. They let him be challenged. He ended up losing, and uh, you know who knows what's going to happen. He's musing about running as an independent. Uh, he's got a friend who's going to potentially run for the Liberals, and he may vote. Well, he said today he wouldn't vote Liberal, but in any event, I, I wonder, John, how much of that speaks to if this is how they treat the people who are kind of the deans of this system, uh, you know, how well is this system going to treat the little guy? And therefore, why should we bother engaging? Well, that's, add that to the long list of human resources problems about keeping people, good people in politics and, and getting them there. I mean, you, you've written a lot about this. Um, you know, they took away the pension plans ages ago, and it's, it's just one thing I've done. Now, that's an interesting case in point, actually, because what unseated Norm Sterling was the power of the Ontario Landowners Association, mm -hmm. which is a very powerful Tea Party-like grassroots organization um, that actually we don't know a lot about, but I think we're going to start to find out more about. Um, perhaps they use social media. I don't know. Um, <laughs> and, and, uh, but I don't, I don't want to go to bat for that too hard. I think, you know, I remember when it first became clear that a party leader couldn't necessarily deliver a riding to a star candidate in the Liberal Party, and that was in a 1987 by-election in Scarborough. Uh, and um, it's now gotten to the point where in the Carlton, Mississippi Mills episode in Ontario, really the leader stood back. In fact, his public posture has been, well, that's just democracy in action. Which is not um, wrong. I mean, everybody it's followed not the rules up, in this case. It's not wrong up to a certain point. I think it's not sustainable to have a party within a party. Um, you know, I mean, if, if Paul Martin had decided in 2000 that he wanted to just sort of take out Herb Gray and if anyone thought he could stop him, good luck to them, and that had happened, 
I don't think Mr. Kretschmer would have said, you know, well, I guess that's just democracy at work. I mean, so there's a basic question about how much Hudak is really the leader of the party in rural Ontario. Um, but this kind of shenanigan, it points to what Michael's talking about, the permeability of the parties. A well-organized group with a common viewpoint can walk all over the existing infrastructure because there isn't much of it left. Um, the whole, you know, when I started out in liberal politics in, in the 1980s, it was a big family. There were lots of things to do. Heck, the kids all, my, my group all went to summer camps and learned liberal fight songs. It was pretty hokey. <laughs> it is a lot like church, actually. <laughs> and guess what? Nobody does that anymore. The mm. whole culture around fundraisers has gone at the federal level because fundraising became illegal. Mm. Um, you know, it, it's, it's one thing after another that's been chipped away at, and I guess, you know, it was only a matter of time before outside groups like the Landowners Association started chipping away at the dean of the legislature. Mm. He's tied, for, he's tied for first. Him and Jim Bradley, both elected in 1970. I hope no one comes after Jim. That would be a mistake. Go ahead. Allison, you wanted to say. This is picking up a little bit on the challenge associated with getting people to run for, for office and how difficult that is to do in the, in the current environment. And I wanted to pick up on a couple of things that um, Keith said, which is really about how political parties have become very professionalized, relying on pollers and professional staff and not volunteers in the same way. And decisions have become very privatized. Um, decisions are being taken every day, even if it's a decision not to make a decision. These are happening. But what I think, John, you've touched on and, and Keith's touched on is those are happening behind closed doors, not on the floor of Parliament, not in a way that citizens can view them or engage with them, um, which I think makes it even harder. As you said, there's a vicious circle at the beginning, makes it even harder for both citizens to engage in the first place, never mind, you know, want to stand up and run for office. So and, and there's an environmental challenge that I think really needs to be addressed. In the government I worked most closely with and where some of my very dearest friends for pollsters and spin doctors and things like that, and I was part of that on a volunteer basis. I do know that at the end of the day, um, a minister could shut us all down with one serious conversation with the Prime Minister. Hmm. Um, and Minister, hmm. Mr. Martin would inevitably side with the people who were actually elected. Um, I don't know how it works in this government or in other, other governments, but I suspect that is eroding away. From the department of you just never know who's watching, <laughs> can we bring this next email up, please? I was told. <clears throat> Go ahead. We'll wait for it. The threat to democracy is in excessive partisanship. Spin doctors should be fired. <laughs> so tweeted Elizabeth May, <laughs> leader of the Green Party. What do we think of that, Sylvia? Well, I think Elizabeth May uh, has made a very strong point uh, in her public statements and, and indirectly in this uh, statement about the cartel problem with Canadian parties, the inability to let new voices in, and to define the existing parties in a given legislature as the only sources of input and inspiration and, and, and leaders for a debate, uh, such that the, you know, the system becomes more and more closed. And we see uh, activities, for example, uh, like an association within a constituency uh, organization try and basically take over, as John describes, a kind of paper tiger. Um, and the party leader's a little worried about, given the absence of volunteers and a real organization between campaigns, uh, concerned about having that uh, group start its own organization. I mean, we know in Ontario we had a group called the Christian Heritage Party at one time that really bled from the Ontario uh, conservative organization. So party leaders are very much concerned about keeping the system rather closed, keeping everybody in this tent, whether it's too big or too small, but not letting in too many new players. And I think that's a frustration as well that we see in a lot of the uh, responses. Michael uh, Bliss. Yes, but unlike the United States, we have th continually thrown up new parties. Uh, the, the New Democratic Party was once a new party. The Reform Party, when Preston Manning decided that it was a closed system, he did something mm -hmm. about it. And reform it was a fascinating breakthrough. They became the official opposition. But look how the logic of Canadian politics then destroyed reform. And there's nothing left of it except the prime minister now. Uh, so it's, it, the, f the funny thing about Canadian politics is that there is this constant pressure on the part of independently minded people to express themselves, but the logic of our pol political system and our excessively tight party discipline, which of course is, is cheered on by the media because they, they, you can spend a whole career uh, in gotcha politics whenever you spot deviation mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. Canadian politics. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, it 
it puts everything into a Procrustean bed, and, and ultimately the independently minded individual goes away and says, to heck Enough. with it. So a few well, minutes to go here. Let me go to Keith on this. So if, if ideology is, and, and the differences in ideology appear not to be turning people on in this country, is it really just all about the personality of the leader? Is that where our politics is today? It's moving in that direction, Steve, and uh, uh, I think we're seeing it certainly played out in this election and has have to in previous elections to a lesser extent. Although I think that there's a yearning on the part of the public to see that there's much, much more than that. It's not that they want to be able to vote simply for the leader of, the, of a party and this is a battle between leaders. They want to have good representation. They, but most of all, I think they want to see their wishes, their interests expressed in Parliament through those that they elect. And if we can change the system to allow that, which I'm absolutely confident that we can, we will see an increase in an uptake of uh, voter participation, uh, engagement in political parties. But political parties, as I said before, have to democratize themselves. And MPs uh, need to be able, the reward system has to be changed to allow MPs to be able to have differences of opinion. And the way to do that, I think, is, is in the leader's offices. Structures have to be put in place, rules have to be put in place to reduce the power that they have so that MPs are, have a much greater control on what the leadership of their parties do as opposed to simply being mouthpieces for the political party. We just got a tweet from a cab driver in Sault Ste. Marie saying he's been driving all over the Sioux, he hasn't seen any election signs at all. So there's a complete lack of interest there. We had Catherine Ford on the program a couple of nights ago and she said because none of the seats are in play in Calgary, there's no interest out there either. You know, except for the one in Edmonton. Doesn't That's seem to it. be many signs in Toronto either. I don't Someone know, sent me a message. Right. They, they said, driving around my riding, it looks like the realtors are going to win this election. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. So many should, homes yeah. for sale. Yeah. They should come to my neighborhood. But Steve, it goes back to your... A fair number Steve, of Bob Ray signs where I live. Okay, go ahead, Keith. But Steve, it goes, to your, it goes to your point. I mean, I think you made a, a very interesting point in terms of what one of the guests did. I, I think that in, in Mr. Harper's case, he knows that if he can decrease the number of people who are voting, he knows that, say, his base is at 32%. 32% of 50% is a lot more than 32% of 59%. And I think that is one of his objectives, is if he can decrease the number of people who are voting and, frankly, turn people off voting, then he has a much greater chance of getting the majority that he craves. A minute to go, Michael Bliss. Go ahead. You wanted to add? No, I find that a kind of bizarre argument. I think that it makes Mr. Harper to be even more Machiavellian than, uh, than, John, than John would. Um, but the way in which the politicians are short-terming everything it's the same criticism that is made of Wall Street bankers, that they have no sense of the long-term health of the system. Uh, there is nobody in the system charged with thinking about the long-term future of political parties or even long-term policy issues. And, and just on the theme of the decline of political parties, political parties don't generate policies mm -hmm. anymore. And, and this election is a perfect example because mm -hmm. all that passes for policy are various ways of bribing the electorate with its own money. We're going to touch on that in a future apart. show. Yeah. Uh, Keith Martin, nice to have you on as an MD rather than as an MP. Uh, good luck in your next career, whatever that may be. And uh, John Thank Duffy you. from Strategy Corp. Uh, Sylvie Bashevkin on the, uh, from the uh, principal from UC on the left-hand side of the table. Allison Lote, the executive director of Samara. Michael Bliss, the making of modern medicine. Got to be a cure for politics in that book somewhere. <laughs> Thanks so much to all four of you here in the studio as well.